Greetings, greetings, greetings to you all. And welcome to the Be That Man Men's School of Ministry devotional for men. It is so good to be back with you another time. This is our fifth session uh, with you and uh, we so look forward to these times together where we can encourage each other in the word. Amen. Iron sharpeneth iron. Praise the name of the Lord. And today we're going to be dealing with the topic of the struggle within. The struggle within. Um, this is taken from a series that I was teaching uh, which is called Discerning and Cultivating Manhood from Men of the Bible. And this one is talking about the Apostle Paul, who was a man of grace and grit. Praise the name of the Lord. So we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 7, verses 14 and 15 from the Amplified Classic. Okay, so we're talking about the struggle within. We're talking about learning, you know, uh, principles of manhood from the Apostle Paul. Amen. We cultivate manhood from these wonderful characters of Scripture. Here's what the Scripture teaches us in Romans 7 from verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, the Apostle Paul says, but I am a creature of the flesh, carnal, unspiritual, having been sold into slavery under the control of sin. For I do not understand my own actions, he says. I am baffled, bewildered. I do not practice or accomplish what I wish, but I do the very thing that I loathe, which, is, which my moral instinct condemns. Now, if I do habitually what is contrary to my desire, that means that I acknowledge and agree that the law is good, morally excellent, and that I take sides with it. However, he says, it is no longer I who do the deed, but the sin principle which is at home in me and has possession of me. For I know that nothing good dwells in within me, the Apostle Paul says, that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot perform it. I have the intention and the urge to do what is right, but no power to carry it out. For I fail to practice the good deeds I desire to do, but the evil deeds that I do not desire to do are what I am ever doing. Now, if I do what I do not desire to do, it is no longer I doing it. It is not myself that acts, but the sin principle which dwells within me, fixed and operating in my soul. So I find it to be a law, a rule of action of my being, that when I want to do what is right and good, evil is ever present with me, and I am subject to its insistent demands. For I endorse and delight in the law of God, in my innermost self, with my new nature. But I discern in my bodily members, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, a different law, a rule of action, at war against the law of my mind, my reason, and making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and wills of my flesh. O oh, unhappy and pitiable and wretched man that I am, who will release and deliver me from the shackles of this body of death? Oh, thank God, he will, through Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, our Lord. So then I, indeed I of myself with the mind and heart serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Bless the name of the Lord. Now this extraordinary passage of scripture has caused quite a stir among many people because of the strong language that the Apostle Paul uses to describe himself. How can this anointed Apostle of Jesus Christ characterize himself and by extension all Christians as unspiritual, a slave to sin, and a prisoner of the law of sin. Aren't these descriptions used in Romans 7 verses 14 to 25, descriptions of unbelievers? 
How can the Apostle Paul describe himself in these terms if he's truly saved? So the key to understanding Romans 7 verses 14 and 15 is on observing Paul's description of the two natures of a Christian. Prior to salvation, we have only one nature, and that is the sin nature. But once we, become, once we come to Christ, we are new creations in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. But we still abide in the old flesh, which has the remains of the sinful nature within it. These two natures, what they do is that they war constantly with one another, continually pulling the believer in opposite directions. <coughs> Excuse me. Second Corinthians 5.17 in the Amplified Classic says, Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation. He is a new creature altogether. The old, previous mould and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. Praise God. Galatians 5.17 simply tells us this from the Amplified Classic. For the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh, godless, human nature. For these are antagonistic to each other, continually withstanding and in conflict with each other, so that you are not free but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. My, my, my. The Passion Translation puts it this way. When your self-life craves the things that offend the Holy Spirit, you hinder him from living free within you. And the Holy Spirit's intense cravings hinder your self-life from dominating you. So then the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are your self-life of the flesh and the new creation life of the spirit. And that is why the Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 5 and verse 16 from the Passion Translation, he says, let me emphasize this. As you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. Now, this scripture for me is always an extraordinary passage that you can go to at any time you're going through challenges. Come on, let me read it to you again. Galatians 5, 16, the Passion Translation. Let me emphasize this, the Apostle Paul says, as you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. Amen. So the desires of the believer's spiritual nature, what do they do? They pull him in the direction of good, while the flesh, the flesh in which he lives pulls him in another direction. The believer wants to do one thing, but has something within him that wants to do the opposite. And I'm sure, as you're listening to this right now, that you can identify with this in some way. So how do these evil desires differ from those of an unbeliever? Well, let's put it in simple terms. The believer hates the evil flesh in which he lives, and he desires to be freed from it. Amen. Whereas unbelievers have no such desire to be freed from it. Paul has a strong desire to live godly. We notice this in the scripture. And, you know, he's so frustrated with, the, with his flesh that, that you know he's warring against uh, the flesh is warring against his spirit that he finally cries out in desperation and he says what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death and of course he answers in is it, the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord in verse 25 so we know that one day believers will be completely freed from the body of death in which we live when we are glorified with Christ in heaven. But until that day, we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us and gives us victory in the ongoing battle uh, with sin. Remember the scripture that I said to you to keep in mind? 
Galatians 5.16, the Passion Translation says, let me emphasize this, <coughs> excuse me, as you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self life amen and amen and amen we've got to remember that my brothers we go through so many challenges you know um and uh i'm saying to us that we need to let the holy spirit be the prime mover of inspiration in our lives here in romans 7 verses 14 to 25 the Apostle Paul puts into practical language the fact that he is a redeemed sinner who still has a carnal body, the flesh that wars against the indwelling spirit. In another place, the Apostle Paul says that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, he says. This is in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. Look at the New King James. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So he acknowledged himself as a chief sinner. <coughs> now, excuse me, this is a powerful uh, personal statement of reality, and this is the honest evaluation of a man who examines himself in the light of who he is and who our Lord Jesus is, and he comes to the conclusion that he is a wretched man in need of deliverance. This is not the deliverance from the penalty of sin that was paid for on the cross, but deliverance from the power of sin. Come on, the power of sin. You've got to remember that as a faithful teacher, the Apostle Paul, in the scripture that we read in Romans 7, uses his own experiences and what he had learned through them to teach other believers how to use God's provision and our position in Christ to overcome the struggle with our carnal nature. My, my, my. And we praise God that we have such a wonderful testament that not only truthfully exposes uh, the struggle between the spiritual nature and flesh in which it resides, but most importantly presents us with the tremendous hope and confidence in our salvation bless the name of the lord i want to say to us today that we need to be reminded in the book of romans chapter 8 and verse 1 it says this therefore there is now no condemnation no adjudging guilty of wrong for those who are in christ jesus who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the spirit. My, 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 my. Come on. When we follow the dictates of the spirit, we can overcome the flesh. <coughs> we cannot deal with these things alone, excuse me. But we can overcome by enabling the power of the Holy Spirit to manifest in our lives. Amen. And we must take heed to the warnings of the scripture. Look at verse 15 of Romans 7. For I do not understand my own actions, the Apostle Paul says. I am baffled. I am bewildered. I do not practice or accomplish what I wish, but I do the very thing that I loathe, which my moral instinct condemns. And this is more than a cry of one desperate man. This describes the experience of any Christian man who is struggling against sin. Come on, somebody. Please note, we must never underestimate the power of sin. Satan is a crafty tempter. And we have a great ability to make excuses. Come on, somebody. So instead of trying to overcome sin with human willpower, we must take hold of the tremendous power of Jesus Christ that is available to us. Amen. This is God's provision for victory over sin. He sends the Holy Spirit to live in us and give us power. And when we fall, 
he lovingly reaches out to us and helps us up. Amen. <coughs> Look at verses 17 and 18 of Romans 7. However, the Apostle Paul said, It is no longer I who do the deed, but the sin principles which is at home in me and has possession of me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot perform it. I have the intention and urge to do what is right, but no power to carry it out. Come on, somebody. Look at what the, the Passion Translation says in these verses, because I wanted to give it to you so that you get a big picture that we can do all things through Christ, who strengthens us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Look at the, trans, the, the Passion Translation of Romans 7, verses 17 and 18. It says, And now I realize that it is no longer my true self doing it, but it is the unwelcome intruder of sin in my humanity. My, my, my. For I know that nothing good lives within the flesh of my fallen humanity. The longings to do what is right are within me. Come on, somebody. But willpower is not enough to accomplish it. Come on. The Living Bible says, but I can't help myself because I'm no longer doing it. It is sin inside me that is stronger than I am that makes me do these evil things. I know I'm rotten through and through so far as my old sinful nature is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. The Apostle Paul was going through his personal challenges, amen. But we have acknowledged here that without the help of Jesus Christ, sin is stronger than we are. And sometimes we are unable to defend ourselves against its attacks. And that is why we should never stand up to sin alone. Amen. Jesus Christ, who has conquered sin once and for all, promises to fight by our side. Amen. If we look to him for help, we will not have to give in to sin. Come on, somebody. Look at verses 23 to 25 of Romans 7. But I discern in my bodily members, the Apostle Paul says, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, a different law, rule of action, at war against the law of my mind, my reason, and making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh. O oh, unhappy and pitiful and wretched man that I am, who will release and deliver me from the shackles of this body of death? Oh, thank God, hallelujah. He will, through Jesus Christ, the anointed one, our Lord. So then indeed, I of myself, with the mind and heart, serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The sin that is deep within us is sometimes known as the flesh or the godless human nature or the law of our members. This is our vulnerability to sin. It refers to everything within us that is more loyal to the world and self than to God. The inward confusion about sin we sometimes feel was as real for the Apostle Paul as it is for us right now, in this time. From the Apostle Paul, Paul we learn what to do about it, don't we? Amen. Whenever he felt lost, he would return to the beginning of his spiritual life, remembering that he had already been freed by Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. So when you feel confused, please, my beloved brothers, follow his example. Thank God he has given you freedom through Jesus Christ. Let the reality of Christ's power lift you up to real victory over sin amen come on somebody when we turn our lives over to jesus christ we are no longer controlled by our sin nature but we are controlled by the holy spirit amen so if we make our confession that jesus christ is lord and believe that he is raised from the dead we are saved we are born again we are born from above and we need to live our lives 
offered to God as a living sacrifice to him. Worship of God, of the God who saved us, should be our highest desire. Amen. And perhaps the best application of Romans would be to apply Romans 1 and verse 16 and not be ashamed of the gospel. Instead, let us all be faithful in proclaiming it. Amen. Romans 1 16 from the Amplified Classic. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ, for it is uh, God's power working unto salvation for deliverance from eternal death. Amen. To everyone who believes with a personal trust and a confident surrender and a firm reliance to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen and amen and amen. Well, I pray that you are encouraged today, my beloved brothers. Let the Holy Spirit be the prime move of inspiration in your life. Amen. Here, Galatians 5.16, as we conclude from the Passion Translation, cannot emphasize this enough. Let me emphasize this, the Apostle Paul says, as you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. Amen. God bless you and God keep you and God cause his face to shine upon you and keep you all in perfect peace. And so until next time, stay blessed, stay focused and stay safe. And remember, be that man, a man after God's own heart, a man who seeks to please God in every area of his life. You can do it. I can do it. Let's do it together. God bless you, and may you, uh, may, may you have a blessed uh, day, and I'll tell you what, look out for the next Be That Man, Men's School of Ministry, devotional. Hallelujah. Please share with others as well. Be a blessing to somebody today. Bye for now. Amen to that. <laughs>